Sumo, Fiji, and is passionate about advocating for strong action on climate change. As project officer for the Pacific Islands Climate Action Network, she worked with members to develop policy positions and briefings for their campaign and advocacy in the lead up to the UNFCCC COP23 negotiations in Bonn, Germany, and engaged with the Fiji COP presidency. PCAN's focus areas included mitigation, climate finance, and adaptation, loss and damage, and the links between gender and human rights and climate change. She is currently completing a master's in diplomacy and international affairs, with a focus on Pacific diplomacy and loss and damage negotiations at the UNFCCC. Please give a warm welcome to Genevieve. Bulavanaka everyone. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land here. I'd also like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this forum and the sponsors who have made this possible. Today I will be speaking about climate change negotiations and loss and damage in the Pacific. So climate change, what is it? Why does it matter? For the Pacific Islands, climate change is about survival. For Pacific Island countries and other small island nations, this is an existential crisis, and it is going to get worse. You can see the impacts already through king tides in Kiribati and coral bleaching in Samoa. Through the devastation from Category 5 cyclones in Fiji and Vanuatu. Two Category 5 cyclones in the space of 12 months, where previously we had none. Yet despite these impacts, or perhaps because of them, Pacific Island countries are fighting. Pacific Island leaders are seen as climate leaders, and they are using their moral authority in that they didn't cause the problem, but are among the first to feel the impacts, to advocate for stronger action and ambition. Before I talk about loss and damage, I'd like to give you some background on the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that we've heard about earlier, and Pacific Island involvement in it since before the convention was established. In 1988, the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, and the World Meteorological Organization, the WMO, established the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, to prepare, based on available scientific information, assessments on all aspects of climate change and its impacts with a view of formulating realistic response strategies. In 1990, the IPCC released its first assessment report, the AR1, which called for collective international action to address climate change impacts. This led to the beginning of negotiations by the United Nations General Assembly on what would become the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UNFCCC was opened for signature at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 and came into force in 1994 once the required 50 ratifications had been achieved. Currently, the UNFCCC has 197 parties. From the time that the UNFCCC entered into force, parties have gathered annually at meetings known as the Conference of the Parties, or the COP to discuss how to achieve the goals set out by the convention to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and minimize climate change impacts. What has been the Pacific involvement in this? Well, Pacific Island countries have been part of the negotiating process since before it began. In 1990, the Alliance of Small Island States, or AOSIS, was established with Vanuatu as its first chair. AOSIS is a coalition of 44 states and has played an active role in the negotiations and since become one of the most important negotiating groups within the UNFCCC. Pacific Island countries, along with other AOSIS members, played a significant role in submitting the original draft of what would become the Kyoto Protocol, 
a legally binding treaty which established emissions reductions targets for developed countries. Despite the legally binding nature of the Kyoto Protocol, not all parties were members as ratification was voluntary and it became clear that not enough was being done to totally curb the adverse effects of climate change. This led to a shift in focus from mitigation to adaptation and in more recent years to more attention being paid to the idea of loss and damage and how countries can adapt to and manage it. There is currently no agreed definition of loss and damage, but one of the working definitions is that loss and damage refers to negative effects of climate variability and climate change that people have not been able to cope with or adapt to. It includes impacts related to extreme weather events such as flooding, droughts or cyclones, and slow onset events such as sea level rise, increasing temperatures, ocean acidification, salinization, and desertification. Some of these impacts are economic and easily quantifiable, such as damages to infrastructure, while others are non-economic, such as loss of life, health, displacement, biodiversity, cultural heritage, or identity. The issue of loss and damage has been discussed and debated by concerned parties since before the establishment of the convention including an EOSIS proposal to establish an international fund for measures addressing the impacts of climate change, as well as an insurance pool for cover against sea level rise in 1991, and discussions around insurance in 2001, but no decisions were taken until 2007 at COP13 in Bali. Article 1 of the Bali Decisions Text calls for disaster risk reduction strategies and means to address loss and damage associated with climate change impacts in developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. But what changed in Bali? A major factor of the inclusion of loss and damage in the Bali Action Plan was the findings of IPCC's fourth assessment report, which asserted that mitigation actions alone could not reduce climate change impacts. AR4 also emphasized the limits of adaptation, which increased the focus on loss and damage, leading to a decision at COP13, uh, sorry, COP16 in Cancun to create a work program for loss and damage. The loss and damage work program was established to consider approaches to loss and damage in developing countries particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And this eventually led to the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage associated with climate change impacts, or the WIM, which, set up, which was set up at COP19 in Warsaw to enhance knowledge and understanding, strengthen dialogue, and enhance action and support for the issue. The creation of the WIM shows an acknowledgement by the UNFCCC that neither mitigation nor adaptation will be enough to prevent losses and damages from climate change impacts. In 2015, at COP21 in Paris, loss and damage was acknowledged as a third pillar of the convention, under Article 8, in which parties recognized the importance of averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, including extreme weather events and slow onset events, and the role of sustainable development in reducing the risk of loss and damage. This gave the space for the whim to be enhanced and strengthened, and was a direct result of the negotiators of Tuvalu working with the United States to find a compromise. At COP22, parties approved a five-year work plan for the whim on loss and damage. And last year, we had COP23, what we call the Pacific COP, because it was led for the first time by a small island developing state, Fiji. There was an expectation that it would highlight and prioritize SIDS issues, bringing a sense of urgency to the negotiations as Pacific Island countries are on the front lines, facing the first and worst impacts from a problem they didn't cause. And while it did highlight the Pacific, unfortunately, the loss and damage outcome in particular was very disappointing. The issue of loss and damage was not made a permanent agenda item for the bodies which work to support the convention, and there was no progress made to provide finance for people already facing loss and damage, or for the whim to do its work. 
The only concrete outcome going forward was the decision to hold an expert dialogue on loss and damage during the intercessionals that have just happened in May. But that also did not substantially progress the issue of loss and damage finance. Loss and damage in the Pacific. Despite the slow progress of negotiations, loss and damage is already being faced in the Pacific. This is not the case of it may happen in the future. It is happening now, with villages being relocated, such as Bunidongoloa in Fiji, whole communities having to change their way of life. It is happening now with increasingly intense cyclones. Earlier this year, Fiji faced back-to-back -back cyclones, Cyclone Josie causing significant flooding in the first week of April, and then Cyclone Kenny hitting a week later, affecting thousands of people. Loss and damage is happening now, with sea level rise threatening the very existence of islands. In 2006, the Solomon Islands lost five of its islands to sea level rise, and a further six were severely eroded. The picture at the bottom shows coastal erosion on the island of Malaita. But we've already seen, and will see in, at the rest of this afternoon, that the Pacific story is not just one of impacts, but one of resilience. We are fighting for our survival, and Pacific Island countries have been at the heart of climate negotiations, working within climate coalitions and calling for greater action from major polluters. There is still so much more to be done. I'd like to conclude by reflecting on three questions that are the focus of a global dialogue known as the Talanoa Dialogue in the climate negotiations this year. And these questions are, where are we? Where do we want to go, and how do we get there? So where are we? Currently, NDCs, nationally determined contributions, and country commitments are inadequate for a 1.5 degree world. Impacts through weather extremes are getting more frequent, especially affecting those who have done little to cause the problem. The climate crisis is one that is rooted in an economic model that is damaging the people and the planet while increasing existing inequalities and violence within and between states. It is a model in which profit is paramount. It accumulates in a few hands, and the majority are left struggling to achieve a decent way of life. Where do we want to go? We need systems change through a safe, just, and equitable global transition to a low-carbon economy and redistribution of wealth, resources, creating real solutions that don't leave our planet and its species, including our own, in catastrophe and ecocide. How do we get there? We need developed countries to take the lead with strong and ambitious actions. Fossil fuel companies need to be held accountable, and there needs to be a safe and just transition to renewable energy as soon as possible. We need to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Australia needs to keep fossil fuels in the ground. As former Kiribati President Anote Tong said in Bonn last year, if you are going to open another coal mine, then you are not transitioning. You are lying to us. You are lying to us, and we see you. How long will you continue to lie while we are fighting for our survival? Thank you.